Well, thanks for having me. Thank you, Saddleback. You know, praise God. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I was fired up. I think this whole opportunity came up during spring practice, right, Ben? And uh, this was about April, so three, four months ago, Katie uh, approached me at practice. Says, you want to come out and share at Saddleback? I said, yeah, that's great. So ever since then, I've been fired up about this and excited. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my wife's here. I've been married for six years. And yeah, praise God. <laughs> praise God. And we have three little ones. Kay yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a lot of character here. That's good. We got three little ones, two girls and a boy, so praise the Lord. And uh, we, we uh, you know, I played at USC, and, and uh, next year is my 13th season with the team, and uh, started coaching right after I got done playing. Okay, obviously God had a plan for me. It wasn't to keep on playing and earn a living that way, so I got to coach. So uh, praise the Lord. Excited about that. So before we start, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Speak through me, Lord. Speak through me. I pray that's your message. I pray that you're pleased. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's get going now. Let's pretend for one moment here all of you guys are Trojans, okay? And in particular, on the defense. Not on offense, on defense. And this is the first thing that we do. We shut the doors like we're closed here. And I'd, I'd get up in front of the team after Coach Carroll talked to the team. And we'd say, basically say, you know what, I don't care what anyone else thinks outside this room. The only ones that really matters, the only opinions that matters are the ones in this room. And the first thing that we do is go out and define success. Like Katie talked about, success in the world's view is defined as, I don't know, the one who is the richest, maybe the one who wins the most, the one who has the most, the one who looks the best, okay, good looking group up there. The one who's the funniest, one who maybe who has the most money. All those things are kind of nice, but really, in God's definition of success, it's about maximizing the gifts that he's given us. Is that not right? All we could do is control and maximize the gifts and the opportunity that God, who's in control, has given us. And that's what we start talking about day one. The reason why we define success from the, from the get-go is this, because we want to put our focus on things that we could control. Now, Coach Carroll and all of us, we, although we like to win national championships, although we like to win a bunch of games and things like that, we don't talk about those things, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe, guys, but we, we, we don't talk about winning, okay? Because there's so many things that happen within the game, within the season, within whatever that are basically out of our control but what we can do is focus in on becoming the best that we could possibly be and trusting in that 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 will be good enough okay does that make sense guys and so that kind of leads me to a, a scenario that happened back in 2003 I'll be brief with this back in 2003 we had a pretty good year we lost the game but we were still ranked number one in the country by by both polls by, by how it worked out, the computers voted us number three, and then basically two other teams got to play for the national championship game. And then whenever the media asked Coach Carroll, aren't you disappointed, this and that, or how are you going to get the team going, he never once complained or belly ached about that. He just said, well, that's out of our control, but wow, what an awesome opportunity we have to play in the Rose Bowl. And that's what we did. He kept the focus on us. And by God's grace, we were able to win and it worked out. And, and we were able to get a share of the national championship. But that's just a small example, which was one of my favorite examples of how when you focus in on the things that God has allowed us to control, how that doesn't lead to fear. The reason why, the reason why fear, like Pastor Josh is saying about fear is an enemy to to performance because fear is basically when you focus in, when you overly you get overly engulfed by things that you can't control. Think about that, guys. When you start focusing on things that's way out of your control, it, that that gets me a little anxious too. Thinking about those things, but when we're able to focus in on the things that God has allowed us to control, 
then we, get, we, then we start feeling a little bit more confident because now, okay, now we're actually doing something about it. Now I want to ask the question, who do we trust in? As Christians, we know who we should trust in. That's God. Like Pastor Josh talked about, God's in control. Nobody else. No person, no man, no other, no circumstance. Nothing happens without God knowing and willing it. Okay, so who do we trust in? Where does our focus lie in? And I got a quick story about from the Old Testament, from the Word. Okay, so we got to make sure we keep, keep studying the Word of God. In 1 Samuel 15, King, King Saul, first king of Israel, he had what you call a lot of the characteristics will make uh, the so-called star in this world. Good looking, tall, strong, all that stuff. And basically, God told him, look, I'm, you're going to go up and fight against the Amalekites, one of their enemies, one of the enemies of the Israelites. And once you defeat them, once I give them to you, you've got to uh, annihilate everybody, man, woman, child, infant, ox, everything. I know, kind of harsh, huh? No mercy, no, no, no prisoners, but God had his reasons. God has his reasons. You got deep, look, that's, that's another story for another day, but he had his reasons. So just like God promised, they got the victory. But what did Saul do? He did kill, they, they did get, get rid of everybody, but they kept the king as a trophy, basically. They kept the oxen and the sheep. The ones that they did kill are the ones that were diseased and the ones that nobody wanted. And then when Samuel, the prophet, comes to go visit him and say, look, what's going on here? God says, go see King Saul. He disobeyed me. King Sa uh, the Samuel confronts Saul, and finally, after a series of excuses and, and, and blaming other people other than himself, he comes to this conclusion. Okay, let me turn to it. Basically... He finally repents. Okay, this is King Saul repenting to Samuel. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord in your words because I feared the people. You hear that? He feared the people and listened to their voice. Think how powerful that is, guys. How this guy is a king of Israel knowingly that God is the one that appointed him to be the king. Now all of a sudden, he takes his focus off God and stops fearing God and starts fearing what the people think. Now, it's easy to just get on the bandwagon and start bashing King Saul. But really, if I'm looking at myself honestly and everyone in this room from upstairs to downstairs is looking at themselves honestly, we've all been in that moment, have we not, guys? Where we kind of like uh, compromise maybe to kind of fit in. Maybe change, change the way we act just to fit in maybe. 